We're starting a brand new series, Church, The Church. It's more than a building. I, I think it's really important that we get back to the biblical foundation of what the church is. Because I think our modern day church in America, we've lost touch with, with biblical reality. And, and we tend to make church a lot of things that it's not. It's not even found in scripture. And uh, we've, we've even made our liberties now religion. In other words, um, what, we, what we have said, well, we're gonna do this and our freedom of worship and our freedom of expression. And, and so we become so free, we've made being free uh, in church religious. And, and, and I'm going to explain more of that as we go, because we have to be careful about our sacred cows. We have to be careful about how we were raised in church, and we need to judge how we were raised with church, whether it's biblical or not. Just because you were raised a certain way doesn't make it right. I mean, some people, they were abused as a child, so they think that's all they know, so they pass that on to their child. Just because they were, that happened to them doesn't mean they should pass it on. Some of you, you've had some horrible or maybe some dead church experiences. And so you're looking for another dead church. You won't find it here. See, the church is the most important organism. It's not an institution. It's not an organization. It is an organism. It's living. And it is the most important organism on the planet. There's nothing that ascends higher than the church other than the name of Jesus because he is the head of the church. See, the church was created by divine inspiration. This isn't Bill Gates saying, hey, I I bought some code. I'm going to call it uh, Word or DOS, and then I'm going to create Microsoft, and no, no. We're not creating a man's institution. The church is not an institution created by man. Yeah. It's divine inspiration, and, and this is where we tend to forget where it should be in our life. We, we, we tend to forget uh, sometimes the priority that it should have in our life, and, and then we start to judge it against other things and what has value in our life, and, and many times it takes second place, third place, fourth place, fifth place. It's more important than any sports team that you can name. If, if, if I was to take somebody from the, the Roman era, a Roman, if I was to take a Roman during the days of Jesus or the early church, and if I could translate them, and if I could just pull them out of time, translate them and put them into some Christian's home, they, their understanding of, of idol worship, they would be in some Christian's home, and they would, they would be confused about what God you serve. You've got this paraphernalia, and you, you're promoting this, and, and this you celebrate, and that you have, but you can't, one, you can't find one thing that's related to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords in their house. The church is more important than any game, more important than the United Nations. That's not hard to beat. Or the WHO, or the CDC. See, the moment that we give the CDC more authority than the church, we got a problem. Or the World Economic Forum, or government, or any other religion. I said any other religion. And a rainbow religion is a rainbow religion. It's a cult. And anything you speak against it, they consider blasphemy against their religion. But we, we need to understand what the most important thing is on the planet, and that is the church. The church is the only, only thing that Jesus died for and gave his life for. It's the only thing. He didn't die for anything. Well, he died for me. He died for you to be a part of the church, not a lone survivor. Not to have church in a coffee shop by yourself. Not to base your religion on your principles and your values and your schedule. He died for you to be a part of something bigger. To be connected to the body of Christ. And it's stronger than anything known to mankind. Nobody has been able to defeat the church. They've tried. They've tried to eradicate it. They tried to destroy it. They tried to put it out of business. They tried to disrupt it. And all it does is make it stronger. It fans the flames to make it stronger. And you know, the church is a place filled with salvation. 
filled with divine healing, wisdom, and power for living. So if that is really the true church, then why, as George Barner reported, I read this last week, that over the last 20 years, 40 million people have departed the American church? Well, I have maybe an answer to that. Maybe they didn't leave the church. They just left a religious institution. Maybe they just left something that had a form of godliness, but they denied God's power. Maybe, maybe they were part of something that had a shape or a shadow of, of religion, and they proclaimed it as Christ following, but yet it didn't, and it wasn't, and it, it failed them because it was dead, not alive, and so they just moved on with life. Now, I can understand leaving something like that because it's just another man's organization. It's like leaving one sporting club and going to another sporting club. It's like changing teams, no big deal. But if, if you're really in the church, the church and the church has, let, let's just say the church is one camp and it has many tents and experienced church is one tent. One tent. And in that tent we have our, our culture and our style of doing it, but it, we have to make sure that it aligns with kingdom culture. But John 15, 19 says, if you were of the world, if you were of the world, if you're a product of the world, if, if you were manufactured in the world, it would love you as its own. Instead, the world hates you because you were not of the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. It should be a compliment to you if you're hated by the world. If the world doesn't accept you, if the world doesn't want to embrace your values and, 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 and your faith, if the world doesn't want to come in contact with you and they, want, they don't want you at their dinner party, they don't want you uh, at, at, at their lunch table, they don't want you around, they can't stand you, that should be a compliment that you're a part of the church. You're representing the church. But a lot of people, they... They have this thing called cool church. It's the cool church. You know what that means? That means it's the church that the world wants to go to because when the world goes, they never have to change anything. They never have to. As a matter of fact, you can live how you want to live, think how you want to think, act how you want to act, and you're still good. You're cool because it's the cool church. The world embra- if the world embraces your church, you're not the church. You're a man-made organization. And you represent man-made values. But I wonder why, uh, you know, sometimes people say, well, if I'm a Christian, do I have to go to church? And I think that's a valid question, too, because some people have not ever been to a real church. They've just been to an organization called church. So they, they go to it, and they go, if this is what church is like, I... I I have people in, in Nepal that, that they struggle with Christianity because they see the bad testimony of so many pastors. I mean, wicked testimonies of pastors. And they say, if this is Christianity, I, I see more moral people in Hinduism. And they convert back to Hinduism. And this is what's happening. People are saying, I see more moral people in the world than I do in the church, so forget church. Forget all this constraint and structure. I'm out of here. And sometimes I think people just avoid church for a lot of different reasons. Sometimes it's just, uh, you know, they don't, they don't want to serve. If I go to church, then I'm going to be in that atmosphere, and they're going to want me to plug in. They're going to want me to get involved. They're going to want me to serve. And, and, you know, I want a life without responsibilities. I have enough responsibilities at home. I don't want more at church. Some people say I don't want to go to church because I just don't want to be around other people. I don't like people. Well, how are you going to heaven then? <laughs> Have you thought about that? You're going to be around people for an eternity. Maybe you just need to learn that your, your feelings should never trump your responsibilities. 
Just because you have feelings doesn't mean your feelings win over your responsibilities. Well, maybe they just don't want to hear about other people's needs. I don't want to, you know, there's people and they got needs. I have needs of my own. And besides, all church wants is their mo- my, my money. They just want my money. Well, if you're born again, it's not your money. Let, let's just kingdom think it now, okay? When you are bought with a price, you are not your own. You belong to Christ, and all that you have is his. So you're just merely a steward of what he has granted you. So be careful when you say, my money. Because it's, it's an expression of your heart. Sometimes um, they've just been hurt by another church or maybe a religious organization. I just, I just can't do it again. I've been hurt. And you know, there's been some horrible things that have happened in the name of religion. In the context of church, please understand. We, you know, in, in America, we would call it a church, but I don't think the Spirit of God is there. We could write Ichabod above the church door. The, the, the presence of God has departed. But a lot of people, they've been hurt. Some people, they're like, I'm not going to go to church. It's, it's full of hypocrites. They say one thing and do another. Well, there are hypocrites, yes, absolutely, but it doesn't do away with the truth and the light and the word and the validation of what God is able to do to people, through people, in people, for people. And, you know, some people, they just don't want to go to church because it's, it's really inconvenient. It is. Well, you know, there's not parking or it's not close and, oh, it's raining today or it's hard to find a seat. What, the, the music's too long. The music's too short. The music's too loud. It's too soft. That preacher, he's a nutcase. <laughs> hey, I'm speaking in general terms, not me. <clears throat> Man, I already know about me. (laughs) Look, Jesus said in Matthew 16, 18, he says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will build my church. And you know what? I love it. I love it. So many Christians said, yes, Lord, you just, they just, they cross their arms. They sit down and they say, yes, Lord, build your church. Go ahead. (laughs) Build it, God. Hallelujah. Woo, glory. They get a little shake going on. Hallelujah. God's building his church while they haven't done a thing. Let, let me put it this way. Some people think they have no responsibility to be a part of building the church, but you know what? The, it's interesting because the Bible tells us that Christ is the head and the church is the body. We are the body. Head, body. Anybody ever heard of, you know, the husband's the head of, head of the household, but the wife is the neck that turns the head? Anybody? Anybody hear that? Anybody? Yes, 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 yes. Some men are waiting for their neck to get turned. <laughs> can, I, can I say anything? <laughs> Look, it's hard to build a house if the head needs a hammer, but the body won't reach for it. I need that hammer. I need a hammer, and the body don't move. It's hard to build something if you need supplies, but the body won't reach out to the wallet and open it up and pull some dinero out, some rupees, some dirham, some British pounds, some CBDC. The body has to engage with the head. The body has to listen. The the nerves, the central nervous system is there for a reason so that the the brain can communicate bodily functions to say, do this, do that, function here, function there. You know, I was sitting there the other day and was eating some French fries. Just a few. Just a few. And I lost, I I was out of my mind. For some reason, I'm eating, and I bit, I... I put the french fry in my mouth, and I put it in too far, and I bit the french fry, but I bit my finger. (laughs) Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anyone? Anybody humble enough to express 
I'm like, I bit myself. Ow! <laughs> See, what happened? I had a disconnect. We need to be connected so we don't hurt ourselves, hurt each other, and that we're doing what God has called us to do. Let, let me help you with the picture of the church. I, I want you to understand the snapshot, the, the, the viewpoint, the, the macro viewpoint from heaven. The church really is the representation or it is the embassy of heaven on earth. It is the embassy of heaven. It is, foreign, it is a foreign nation on foreign soil. This is sacred ground. Now, now let me just say, this is a building. And if this building is empty, the building doesn't make it sacred. We are the church that come together and make it sacred for what we are doing here. But we come together and we represent a kingdom nation on foreign soil. And it is God's manifest presence of the kingdom of God here on this earth. It's foreign, though. It's foreign. Remember, the kingdom of heaven is foreign. So we are representing a foreign nation on this, on this earth. We have foreign customs, foreign language, foreign ways of thinking, a foreign economy. We think differently. We act differently. We represent the kingdom, not the earth. The Bible tells us that we are foreigners and strangers or aliens in a foreign land. Look, 1 Peter 2.11 says it this way. Dear friends, since you are immigrants and strangers in the world, I urge that you avoid worldly desires that wage war against your lives. So live honorably among the unbelievers. What does that mean? He's talking to you as an ambassador. He's talking to us as believers representing God, as we are presenting ourselves to unbelievers. He says this, he says, live honorably among the unbelievers. Today, they defame you as if you were doing evil. But in the day when God visits to judge, they will glorify him because they have observed your honorable deeds. Why? Because we're representing the kingdom of heaven. So what does that mean? That means that we're ambassadors. When you're born again, you become an ambassador. You don't represent yourself, your agenda. You don't represent the world. You don't represent the world's agenda, the world's culture. You represent the kingdom culture. And so we're an ambassador. And we represent the one that sent us. We don't represent the one that we're sent to. And this is where people get confused. We're so busy trying to connect with the world that, that we're listening to the world. How do we change? How do, what do we need to change in church so that you'll come? How, how, how many songs do we need? Do, how do we change the music? What temperature do you like? What don't you like to hear about preaching? What, what bothers you? And we'll just take that out because coming to church is more important than saving your soul. Getting you on our doors and putting you in our seat and we can call ourselves a mega church is so much more important than keeping the gospel right where it's at and, and, and bringing you to a point of decision. So we have to remember that we don't represent the world. We, we have to represent the one that sent us. Second Corinthians 6.17 says, come out from among unbelievers. Say, come out. Come out from among unbelievers and separate yourselves from them. Look, if you live according to God's word, if you surrender your heart to God's word, there's going to be a natural coming out. Because the world is going to quit inviting you when you quit compromising. Oh, they're no fun. They won't smoke. They won't drink. They don't do drugs. They, they, you know, they're, they're the wet blanket on the party. They ask to pray. Can you believe that? Every time we get together, us girls, and we have just our little girls' lunch, she always wants to pray before we eat. Come out 
from among the unbelievers and separate yourselves from them and don't touch their filthy things and I will welcome you. I will welcome you. So we have this ambassadorship responsibility. But we have to remember that the kingdom of darkness is trying to come into the church. The kingdom of darkness is always trying to get in the church and then get in leadership so it can change the values of the church and the control of the church and the structure of the church so it's no longer a church. Look, we, we can look at this in, 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 in certain uh, political venues. We, 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 we can see what um, the Muslims have done in Michigan. And, and, and they, they come in and they, they bring in a, a huge community and they, and they just collectively come together and then they start taking offices and, and winning offices and suddenly they, everything, and now we're voting in Sharia law and we're like, what's going on? Yeah. Right? This is what happens with the rainbow religion. And this is what's happening with the church today. This is why we have so many woke churches because they've allowed woke doctrine to come in, people to get into authority places, and now they can't teach the truth. Look, the church is the only unstoppable weapon on the planet. And the only way the kingdom of hell can stop the church is if we will secede our power. If we will let them come in and take control of our church. That's the only way it works. Because the church is the only unstoppable weapon. I want to I show you something because some people are stuck in the Old Testament thinking of church in the New Testament, uh, new covenant that we're under today as the church. Because the church wasn't in the Old Testament. The church is in the New Testament. There's a reason by, th by this. Ephesians 3, 9, and 10. I'm going to read some scriptures here for you because I want you to cap capture this. God, who created all things so that through the church, through the what? Church. Through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be made known to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. Now, Ephesians tells us that we don't war against the flesh. Our fight is not against flesh and blood. In, in other words, our fight isn't against other people, but it's against principalities and powers of darkness. It's against demonic spirits in heavenly places. There are three heavens. Three heavens. The first one is the atmosphere. That's from here to the, the sky. The second one is the second heaven. That is from the stars to beyond. And the third heaven is beyond what we, what we can see is where God, and, uh, God abides with the saints. So three heavens, okay? So when, when, uh, when, when Paul said, I was caught up into the third heaven, that's where, uh, that's where God is, okay? So three heavens. We war against principalities and powers of darkness. They're in the heavenlies. What is that? The first and second heaven. So we have spiritual darkness that's, that's ruling over this earth because Satan is the god of this earth, Okay? And this is why, and I, I want to go back to Daniel because a lot of people may not know this, but Daniel prayed. He was praying a prayer, and then it says in Daniel 10, 12, we can put this up, the angel came and said, don't be afraid, Daniel, since the first day you began to pray for understanding and to humble yourself before God, your request was heard in heaven. So the first day he prayed, boom, it got there, and, and God heard it. But for 21 days, the prince, the demonic prince of the king of Persia, blocked my way. So there was a war in the heavenlies to try to bring the answer to Daniel. For 21 days, they were warring, trying to get the answer to this earth. Because this place was dark. It was evil. Jesus didn't come, and he hadn't conquered death, hell, and the grave. So, so that's why they were under the old covenant. So... So the answer did come, but I want you to see the war that's going on spiritually before God had Jesus come and establish the church. So now I want you to get the point here when he says this in Matthew 16. Put this up, Matthew 16. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. That's very important right there. The gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Listen, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you allow on earth shall 
uh, bind on earth or, or disallow on earth shall be disallowed in heaven. A lot of people don't understand binding and loosing. So that's what it means. To bind means I disallow it. So to bind on earth, I shall be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose or allow on earth will be allowed in heaven. So he's just empowered us as the church to do something that could never be done before the beginning of the church. There was always a war, always a fight to get the power of God down here on earth. Are are you hearing me? There was always... a struggle to get God's power to work down here on earth. But he said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to establish my church. I'm going to put my embassies all over this world. And when you ask, it will be done in the name of Jesus. There's not one lock that we can't unlock. There's not one gate, not one door that the gates of hell can try to keep us out that we can't open in the name of Jesus. That's why the church is unstoppable. That's why the world is against the church because they know we are the only threat to their existence and their control. So we don't have to wane and wring our hands and say, oh, please, God. He's already given us the keys to the kingdom. It's done. You don't have to war. You don't have to fight. You proclaim and you stand and you occupy till he comes. We draw down the power of heaven. We draw it down. Churches are not a bunker, a bomb shelter to hide and hunker down. But this is a place where people, oh, I can't, I just wish I could get there. I just wish I, you know, it's interesting. We were in line and uh, I forget which Haley was in line. We were going through the immigration in Dubai and I had my, we had our passports out. And I said, look at your passport. And she looked at it, and I said, I want you to know that this is the most coveted passport in the world. I said, look at all these other passports and these other people. And they wish they, wished they had your passport. Because your passport, you can go anywhere. Any, anywhere. Look, that's the way the kingdom of God is. That's the way these churches should be, truly the church that I can't wait to get in there. I want heavenly citizenship. I want my kingdom passport. I want my identity with Jesus Christ. This needs to be the thing that is so real and so present. See, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close with this little story. I didn't plan on sharing it. I'm going to share it in context, but I'm not going to share it in detail because anonymity is very important. We were in Nepal, and we were doing youth services, a, a youth outreach. And um, in that service, Lim preached a great message, and um, the team, they got up, and they were praying with the people, and I just felt like I, I needed to sit back and just let the team work and, and uh, engage. But I knew that when that was done, the Lord was prompting me to go up and, and pray for a specific thing. And so when they finished and Lim said he was, he was done, I, came, I went up. And the uh, Lord laid on my heart to pray for people with the spirit of suicide. And We ministered to, I want to say, four specific people that came up. And they were were intense prayers, but freedom. Freedom. I'm just just setting the, the framework. And I look over at one of the young ladies that I'd been working with on our team for the last seven years. And... Mina was praying with her, and she was crying. She's just a young lady, part of our team. And so when I was done, and uh, Josh was going to come up, and, and I, f- I felt like we just needed to end uh, not like the way we planned. I, wa- I wanted to keep it um, just a, an atmosphere of authority. I didn't want to change the atmosphere, and so he came up, and, and he did a, a an expression dance to tremble. You make the darkness tremble. Jesus, Jesus, you make the darkness tremble. 
So I walked over to the side, and as I, I stood there, I want you to understand, I'm like a father to this young girl, a father figure. And she ran to me as soon as she saw me that Mina was praying for. She ran to me, and she just grabbed onto me, and she started crying, and I, I didn't know what's going on. I'm just, I'm just holding her like this, and, and I, I, I don't know. So I just, I just started praying in the Holy Spirit. Thank God that we can pray in the Holy Spirit, you know. I didn't know what to pray, but the Holy Spirit does. And as soon as I started to pray in the Holy Spirit, she started to scream. And she started to scream and kick. And there was a, uh, like a love seat couch that was on the side of the stage there, and it was in a nice spot where she had anonymity. It was private. We had several team leaders there, and Lem and, and Ruth was there and some others. And we got her to the couch, and I, I just started praying for her and had my hand on her head. And now, some of you, you've never encountered spiritual darkness before. And, and I want you to know that spiritual darkness is just as real here as it is there. But I'm going to make my point in a second. I'm praying for this girl, and I rebuke this demonic spirit off of her in the name of Jesus. I say, you have no authority over her. I have the authority. I have the spiritual right over this girl's life. You get off her in the name of, she is screaming. She is convulsing. She's never acted this way in seven years. Some of you, you, you would think, well, she needs counseling. Some of you, you would think, well, she needs medication. You see, you're using your natural mind to try to solve a spiritual problem. In the name of Jesus, come out. I took my hand off. I don't know. I just knew. And she just, whew. we got her water, got her calmed down. But I was so mad. I was so mad. And I'll tell you why I was so mad. Because I know this girl has been in, in a home of a pastor for the last seven years. And you know what? You can't live in a Christian atmosphere You cannot be around a God-fearing atmosphere for seven years and not allow that demon to be confronted. See, somebody that is demonic possessed, they're happy to sit in religious circles and, 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 and services, and they're happy to sing religious songs. They're happy to do all the religious things and hear religious sermons so long as the glory of God doesn't show up. But if the glory of God shows up, they have a problem, and they cannot stand it because they're being confronted that they are, they are trespassing in the name of Jesus. I'm sick of religion because it's dead. It's futile. It's empty. And it does nothing but hurt people, to bind people, to enslave people. But the Spirit of God, He comes to give life, liberty, freedom. And that means that we have to embrace the church in a way that we got to shake off some old old ways of thinking. we got to shake off some old things that we think is church. Because I care about worshiping one thing and one thing alone, and that is Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Jesus. I said Jesus. Say it with me. Jesus. Say it again with me. Jesus. Jesus. Jesus, we surrender our hearts to you today. Father, help. Help us in our walk. Lord, if we've been entrenched in ways of thinking concerning what church is and religion renew our mind renew our mind renew the pathways in our thoughts and Lord never let our help us that we don't allow our feelings to overcome our responsibilities help us to stay focused on you and that we represent you 
Not us, not the world, but you. In the name of Jesus. So if you're here today, I want to ask you this question because you may not be born again. You might be good at, at attending church, but it doesn't mean you're going to heaven. Salvation is free, but I want you to know it's going to cost you everything. And it will be the best decision of your life. See, Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. You, you can't find it in Buddha, in Muhammad. You're not going to find it in a crystal. You're not going to find it in a bottle. Salvation comes through Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. If you're sprinkled as a child, you just got wet. If you're confirmed, you're confirmed by a man, but not by God. Romans says it this way, if you will confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is your Lord, you will be saved. And there's so many people that are not saved that go to church every week, and it just blows my mind. They hear the same information week after week, and they no thanks, no thanks. And it just, I just want you to know, if you reject this today, this may be your only opportunity, and that means you're accepting hell for eternity. Eternal punishment, eternal separation from God. I've done my part, God's done his part, but you refuse to do your part. But you know what? I believe that the conviction of the Holy Spirit is here and strong enough to show you the weight of your sin and that you can't save yourself. You are not good enough on your own works. Your own merits is not going to take you to heaven. The only thing that's going to get you to heaven is the surrender to the blood of Jesus Christ to be able to wash you clean today. So what we're going to do is I'm going to count to three. One, two, three. And if that's you, I'm going to clap my hand. I want you to raise your hand if you want to get born again or you need to renew that commitment. Maybe you drifted off. Maybe you went off the rail, but it's time to come home again. Time to recommit your life to Jesus. If that's you, one, two, three, you raise your hand. And I'm going to pray a prayer with those that are watching live. And we're going to, I'm going to say the words. You repeat it after me. So here it is. Get ready. One, raise a hand. Two, three, lift it up. If that's you today. Yes, I see that. Yes, I see that. Yes, I see that hand. 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 Anyone else? Anyone else? Yes, I see that hand. Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? Anyone else? All right, let's pray right now. Heavenly Father, come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. Forgive me of my sin. I accept your son Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Live in me as I live for you in Jesus' name. Come on. And everyone said, amen. Come on.